using these rules up here on the example problems. So we'll be using the rules about breaking up your uh, interval and uh, adding the area on different parts. So we'll mostly be using these rules. So we're going to suppose that the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f is 5. So there's 5 units of area under the f function. And the integral from 1 to 4 of f is negative 2. And the last supposition, negative 1 to 1 of h, is 7. And then I want you to find integral from 4 to 1 of f. Some of these are going to be uh, easy. Some of them are a little more tricky. 2f plus 3h, negative 1 to 1. And the third one is multiply the two functions. That's f times g. And the last, from 4 to negative 1, f. So figure out any of these that you can. Some of them are relatively straightforward. So I'll just give you a hint. The first one is similar to that. So how do you use that plus the rules that we wrote down to get this area? Probably. So I want you to do them right now. So look back at the rules. And if you didn't write the rules down, maybe your neighbors got them written down. There's about five or six rules you need. And it might be useful to write a number line. It looks like we're going from negative 1 to positive 4. And we're also going to use the value 1. So it might be helpful to think about that number line right there. Those are the 3x values <coughs> that, every, that we're using here. It's a good time to ask any questions if you have them. Uh, it's not. Uh, 
Yeah, I think I'm like, well, I was thinking like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I didn't, it actually doesn't matter what G is at all for that particular interval. Okay. So just, it's just lock. Oh. No, wait, it would be negative. Yeah, yeah, right. Because it means the ones are flipped. It's one negative one, negative one. Those are negative. Okay, how do I figure out the first one, one to four, or four to one of F? So this is negative. 1, 4 of f. So swapping endpoints and it's negative. So it's negative, negative 2, which is regular 2. Oh, you have to write that extra stuff. Well, <laughs> do you have to write that? Yeah. No, but if you get it wrong, I'm going to give you zero <laughs> points. So if you wrote this step, at least I knew. I can see that you knew that you should flip them over. And then maybe you just copy, maybe you wrote 5 instead of 2. Because you, maybe you read like the one up there instead of the next one over. Does it matter which one is negative on top, negative on bottom? Is there like uh, if is it the how does the graph works? Generally, you're going to see the smaller on the bottom and the bigger on the top. Is that from, from but negative? you can always swap them, and then it will just be negative. Okay. So generally, you'll see the small one on the bottom, big one on the top. But it's not true always. Okay. Probably ninety. 5% of the time that'll happen. All right, second one, we're going to use the sum rule. So if I go up to here, we're using the f plus g rule right here. At the same time, we can use the constant multiple rule on each part. So we're basically going to do apply both rules at the same time. So we got 2 times the integral negative 1 to 1, f plus 3 integral negative 1 to 1, h. And we have these values. 5 is the f value, 2 times 5 plus 3 times our h is 7. So we got 10 plus 21 is 31. So. Can you just write 31? Yeah, but if for some reason you thought 3 times 7 was 24, and so you wrote 34, I'd probably give you 0, even though in your head you did most of the right stuff. So how much work do you need to show? Enough to convince me you know what you're doing. So if I just see a wrong number, I'm not convinced you know what you're doing. Is that? Makes sense as to as to what I'm expecting <coughs> when I'm grading your exam. So if you can't convince me you know what you're talking about, then I can't give you, uh, I can't, uh, you know, give you the credit for knowing it if you didn't convince me. Question. So do you always write the coefficient in front of the integral instead of like I wrote it parentheses two parentheses times five. I mean, you can leave it inside like that, but I'm just, you can write it either way because they're equal. It's the same thing. So how do you want to write it? I don't know. I don't know how you want to write it, but I can tell you they're the same thing. So they're both correct. All right, f times g. I didn't even write anything about the g function, except it doesn't matter what function is g. Why is this 0? Not because I don't have a g function. 
because we're not moving our x value. So the width of our region is 0. So it doesn't matter how tall it is. If it's positive, negative, the width is 0. So no matter what, the area is going to look like that. Well, it should be a straighter line. But whatever y value you have, it's a rectangle that has 0 width. So no matter how tall it is, it's going to be 0. I meant to write h there, but it actually doesn't matter. It's still going to be 0. All right, last one. What do we have to do here? Did I stump all of you? Yes. Excellent. All right, let's go small to big. So I'm going to fl uh, flip the two endpoints. Yeah? So you're going to have to add uh, the first, the S, yeah, add those two. We're basically using those two. But we've got to do it carefully because the endpoints are out of order. So there's two things we have to do. You don't have to do it in the order I'm doing it. You could break it apart uh, a different way. So I just did the endpoint swap, and that meant negative. Oh. All right, we'll finish this one. So this is going to be negative. And now we're going to break it. That's why I wrote the number line. We're going to go negative 1 to positive 1, and then positive 1 to positive 4. So that's why I wrote the number line here. We're going from negative 1 to 4, and all I'm going to do is break it up around 1. So instead of going all the way, we'll go negative 1 to 1 plus 1 to 4. And now negative 1 to 1 is 5 plus 1 to 4, negative 2. So that's negative 3. Any questions on that? Uh, in the, when you, like, the ones that you have, like, say, suppose or whatever, it has, a, it has a positive one on the bottom underneath the 4 up and Yep. And then it's a negative. And then it's a negative when you wrote in blue. Is that correct? I don't know. Like, you change the sign. So I, my first step was swapping endpoints. So I went small to big. So it would be lined up in a like, natural way. So I could just think about small x value, middle x value, big one. Uh, but why did it, like, but after why did it change to negative? You're talking about the first step in blue? Yeah. So <coughs> I saw that my endpoints were going big back to small, and I wanted to go small to big. It's generally easier to write them down if you go small to big. So that was my first step, is putting the x's in order. And the price to pay for that was it becomes negative. So that's why that negative sign survived the whole time, because I made that swap. Uh, I didn't have to do that first. I'll solve it a second way in green. So I could. I could rewrite this to go from 4 to 1 plus 1 to negative 1. So I could write it like this. Except it's a little harder to think about because you're going backwards across the number line. So it's a little bit more tricky. And then here, negative one, or 4 to negative 1, that was the first one we got, which was 2. Plus, and the last one, this is the... Wait. So 4 to 1. Yeah, that's 2. And then the last one was 1 to negative 1, which is the opposite or the negative of that right there. So I skipped a step here, but <coughs> you'll still get negative 3. So it doesn't matter which way you go. I think the green or uh, the blue way is a little more intuitive. You know, put the x's in order, and then it's pretty easy to see if, with the number line what you're doing.
our next example <coughs> we'll take a super easy function f of x equals x on the interval let's do 0 to b And first, I want you to compute this area using geometry. So I want you to graph it out and use geometry to figure out how much area is under that curve. I picked the super easy function, slope 1, y intercept 0. So you can sketch it in two seconds and then tell me how much area between 0 and you can assume b is greater than 0. How much area do we have? One half of b squared. One half b squared. So one half base times height. And this is a isosceles triangle. So I, it is a right triangle, but you don't need that fact here. The isosceles is the fact you need. Well, I guess that let us use the height also as b. So we got two measurements of b. Area equals one half base times base. Plus one half base squared. All right, so that's area using geometry. Not terribly complicated uh, computation. So what we're going to do now is use calculus. So same computation using calculus. So I want the integral. So our area is the integral. This is the area between the x-axis and your function for these x values. So what I wrote down, that's our f of x function, represents the exact same amount of area that's shaded in green there. So our a is 0 in this case. Our b is just the letter b. So we do here, take the antiderivative. So what is the antiderivative of x? Almost. That's the derivative, the opposite antiderivative. What function has a derivative of x? So x squared is like my first intuition. And then what's the derivative of x squared would be 2x, which might be what you were thinking. Um, but I want regular x, not 2x. So I need x squared over 2. So that's the antiderivative. So you can take a guess and check. And derivative x squared over 2 is regular x. Now the endpoints, we'll learn this in the next section. What you do with your endpoints, you're going to plug in your first endpoint. For, and these are x values. So you get b squared over 2 minus, and now you plug in 0. And minus 0, this is just 1 half b squared. So that's the same area we got using geometry. We will go over in the next uh, section what this actually means. So you don't need to know it right now.
to actually use calculus to evaluate this integral, you need to do a trig substitution, which doesn't happen until Calc 2. So we can't actually use calculus to integrate this. So what we're going to do instead is use geometry. So this is the area. between x-axis and the function. What function do we have here? Squared one minus x squared. Yep, square root 1 minus x squared. What about our interval for x values? What interval do we use? 0 to 1. So how do we use geometry? We're going to graph the function and think about the x values that we're using and then see does that have a nice shape that I can use geometry. How in the world do you graph this thing? So some of you might recognize what that is already. If you don't, let's make it less ugly. We probably don't like square roots, so let's square both sides. And we'll add x squared to the other side. What is a graph of this equation? It was the basis of everything you learned last quarter. Unit circle, centered where? At the origin. So this is a unit circle centered at the origin. Is this the graph of a function? Nope. So it's certainly not the graph of this particular function. If it's not the graph of any function, it can't be the graph of this function. Why is it not the graph of a function? <coughs> yeah, so it fails the vertical line test. So there are lots of x values that have two y values. So we have to make it a function not just a function, we have to make it this function right here, this f of x function. So think about this function. Is there any way to get negative y values out of here? Is there any x value you can put in and get out a negative? But you can definitely get out positive values and 0. So that means <coughs> when we did our algebra, we actually picked up extra, uh, extra solutions. So this form right here actually is not exactly the same thing. When we squared both sides, up here, y had to be greater than or equal to 0. That was no longer true on the next line. So when we did our algebra, we picked up extra solutions. So what happens when y is greater than or equal to 0? You don't get the bottom half of the circle. So the bottom half is going to get erased. Now, we have a half circle. So you should remember the area of a full circle. Is this the area that we're looking for? I definitely agree this is the function graph. Well, I better be careful. Negative 1, a positive 1. So this is the graph of the function, but do we use all this area in here? What part of this area should I use? The right side. So we got to start at 0 and stop at 1. That was written down from our x values here. So yes, the graph of the function is all this, but we only want this part of the graph right here. So who can impress us with their circle area formula? 
pi r squared. So how does our area differ from the full circle area? It's a quarter. So we got a quarter of the circle. So our actual area will be one fourth circle area. Or one fourth pi r squared. And what is the radius? Radius is one. We get that unit circle. So area is pi over four. So we didn't actually do calculus other than uh, we only use calculus to determine what does this actually mean. It means area under the curve from one x value to another one. And once we knew what it meant, we used geometry to figure out what that actual value was. So the last topic we're going to look at is average value. So when you hear the word average or mean, what does that mean to you? So if we got two numbers, we add them together, divide by two. What if we have n numbers? Can you average n things together? If I gave you 20, 20 numbers, could you tell me their average? Yeah. Hopefully, you could do that in middle school at some point. What do you do? You add them all together, divide by the number of numbers. So here, if you think about average value between 0 and 1, the problem is there's an infinite number of numbers between 0 and 1, an infinite number of y values. Looking at this, if I was just estimating average value, I'd probably go with maybe something like this right here. No, it should be a little higher up than that. Maybe the average value is somewhere right about there. If you average all the y values on the board, it would take an infinite amount of time to do it, but the average would be somewhere about there. Unfortunately, there's an infinite number of y values, so I can't average them together. If there was 20 y values, if there was just, maybe we'll make it easier, if there was five y values, I could average those five numbers together. No problem. Where would their average be? Something like that right there. So I could average five of them together. I could even put 100 down and average 100. But I can't average all infinitely many y values together. So we're going to do instead, we're going to do instead for the average, we're going to figure out what is the area and then divide it by the width. So what is the area and divide it by the width. And that will give us the average. So you should be thinking, that's not what they told me average was. Well, you didn't think about average in a geometric way. So let's take a real easy example. Let's do the average of 4 and 6. What's the average of 4 and 6? 4 and 6. 5. All right, 4 plus 6 is 10, divided by 2 is 5. All right, we're not going to go over that math. What I do want you to think about is the geometry of this. So I'm going to draw a height 4 rectangle and a height 6 rectangle right here, height 4, height 6. What's the width? 2. What is the area? Count up the number of boxes. 4 and 6 is 10. So we got 4 here, 6 here, total area 10. So what is the area divided by the width? Not a coincidence. 
So what happens if we get crazy and throw another number in here? Let's say I put a 2 in. Well, all of a sudden my area goes up by 2, but my width goes up by 1 more. So my width is not 2, my width is now 3, and the area is 10 plus 2, 12 over 3. So now the average value is 4, so the average value dropped. So now it should be a little more clear, average is actually a geometrical property as well. So you can look at the average of heights of stacks of blocks, or however you want to think about numbers. We're going to use this, except the difference is our functions aren't going to be uh, step functions. If you had a step function, you'd be doing regular average, basically. Our functions are going to look something like this. So there's going to be all this extra area that we can't just compute by hand like this. So we're going to have to actually get the area and then divide by the width. The width is easy to find. It's just big minus small. So still same area over width, except now we're going to go, our width is going to be going from A to B. And we're going to look at the area underneath the function from A to B. So exactly the same stuff, area and width, except now we're going to write out the area <coughs> as an integral from A to B, fx dx, divided by, so that's our area, what is the width of this region. B minus A. If you do A minus B, you'll get negative width. So you want to go big minus small. B minus A. And some places you might see it written like this uh, as a multiplication with the reciprocal, but either way, it means the same thing. So that's the average value on the interval right there. And just kind of eyeballing this, it looks like the average value, if I drew some line through here, would probably be somewhere right around there. There'll be some y, y, y values that are below, some y values that are above. So that's the average value. So our last example from this section will be an average value problem. So find the average value of the 1 minus x squared function from 0 to 1. So the good news is you already know, oh, this one's going to be really boring. Let's go negative 1 to 1. Otherwise, our width is 1, and you would be dividing by 1. That's not exciting. So first, you need the area and a width. The width is very easy to get. What is the width? And width is 2, 1 minus negative 1. Now the area, I can write it down. Negative 1 to 1. So it's really similar to the area we computed earlier, except our interval, our x values, are a little different. Take about 30 seconds and look at that area that we computed earlier. And think about the area that we need now. And also write down the average that you get. So we got the half circle, which will be pi over 2. So 
we get pi over 4 as our average value. Uh, that was the, so here we did a quarter circle area. I just did a half circle area, or two quarters. I actually did two quarters the way I wrote it down. I just took that area and then said, well, there's the exact same amount over there. So it's going to be double what we got. And we know that because of the points. Yeah, we went all the way from negative 1 to positive 1. Um, or you could have just said, hey, it's half an area of a circle. So it's half pi r squared. So our next section is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So FTOC, that is the fundamental calculus. So before we write down the fundamental theorem, we'll do some computations first. So I'm going to define a function, and I'm going to call this one capital F. So the reason I'm using t's instead of x's on the inside is because I want to only use x's um, outside of the integral. And I also need this little f function to be continuous. So we're going to let f of x equal this, where little f of t <coughs> is continuous. And now, like everything else we do, we're going to take a derivative. Although this is weird, we're going to take a derivative of an antiderivative. What does your intuition tell you? Should cancel out in some way. All right, so that's what your intuition should tell you. How in the world do we take a derivative of something we have no idea how to take a derivative of. How did we create all of our derivative rules? Every single one of them. We didn't know what the power rule was. How do we create that? How do we create the product rule? Yeah, I did tell you. And you listened. Use your eyes and your ears. How did I teach you? I proved it. What did I start my proof with? The definition of derivative. Definition of derivative. So we're going to start back with the definition. How do you create derivative rules? You don't just invent them. You start with the definition of derivative and figure out what you get. All right, so I know I've told you you don't need to memorize definition of derivative anymore. But you should at least have some awareness that it exists. So we got limit h approaches 0, fx plus h minus fx over h. So that's nothing new right there. That's been around since beginning of chapter 3. So now we're going to write down <coughs> what is f of x plus h. Remember, this is the most difficult part is don't screw this up. So I'm going to very carefully. Where I see x, I'm going to put x plus h in its place. Good news is there's only one place x appears. So this one's not too difficult. And I'm going to write the uh, h right here as a 1 over h product. 
So instead of writing some big fraction with an h on the bottom, I'm just going to bring it out front and multiply by 1 over h, because the inside is going to get pretty complicated. So a is not x, so a is going to stay the way it is. That will be a minus, not a plus. Minus. So that, what I wrote down, is f of x plus h right there. And what I'm going to write down here is regular f of x. So that's right off the definition. Just carefully, you got f of x plus h minus f of x. What integral rules can I use here? Unfortunately, a is on the bottom and the bottom. So it would be really nice if this a was up on the top. So let's put a up on the top. So what do I have to do when I swap endpoints? So a negative sign. So it already had negative sign, so we're going to un-negative it or write it as a plus. So we got minus that negative. So why does it make a difference if the a is on the bottom line? Uh, it's the direction. You're going to go from x to a or from a to x. It's the direction you're going to travel on the number line. So it makes you go the opposite direction. And we didn't make any assumptions about uh, if a is bigger or smaller than x. So I can't say for sure one of them is going to the left and one's going to the right. All I can say is whatever direction we went here, we're going the opposite direction here. So I, I can't say if we're going left or right on either one. What other rule can I use? So we're adding, and we got a and a. So I'm not sure they're ordered in this way, but maybe they are. Doesn't matter how they're ordered. If you go from x plus h to a and then to x, you can just go all the way and cut out a. So I'm going to go all the way from x plus h to x. Now I'm not sure they're lined up like this, but it doesn't matter. That rule doesn't require them to be ordered in any way. So this is the integral from x to x plus h. And I somewhere forgot my limit. That's kind of important. So 0, 1 over h. Well, that looks a bit better. So unfortunately, this is where our calculus rules run out. I can't, there's no other rule to make this look more simple. So here is where we're going to have to use some geometry. And the idea is h is getting small. So that's what that limit is telling us. h is not very big. It's not equal to 0, but it's close. So it's going to be very small. Let's assume it's positive, and then I can redraw this and we'll assume it's negative. So we'll go for both, uh, both ways. So h is getting smaller, so that x plus h is moving closer to x. Now what does the x function, uh, the x function, the f of t function look like? The only assumption I made on it is it's continuous. And that's an important assumption. So I don't know what the f function is going to look like, but I do know that I can draw it without any jumps because it's continuous. So what we're looking at right here is the area, and I'll call it A. So we're looking at the area right there. 
1 over h. What property does h measure over here? how wide this is. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is an average value. It's the area divided by the width, or multiplied by the reciprocal of the width. So this is the average value. So this whole thing is the average of fx on the interval x comma x plus h. What happens when h gets smaller and smaller and smaller? So I'm going to, in green, let's cut h in half. So we're only concerned about the left part of this. And h is going to get even smaller. And then h is going to get even smaller. What does the average value get very close to? It gets close to that height right there. Do you see that? The average value, as this gets thinner and thinner and thinner, is going to get very close to that height right there. So what's that height? It's the y value above x. So that's f of x right there. So that's the height measurement right there. So our average value is going to approach f of x. So this whole thing right here, when we take this limit, we're going to get f of x. That's the height right there. Uh, the same thing happens when, x, uh, when h is negative. So this is probably the most important theorem in calculus. It's fundamental.